Good afternoon, everybody. Sucking down a bang. Oh, I haven't showered. Oh, too, too much energy. That ship has sailed. Um, okay, so um, spring break is over. Um, hope you're all hanging in there. I'm going to start on the first blood spatter lecture. Okay, there's Yuri. Oh, look who we have. Hey, Budge. Um, okay, so those of you in forensic science have already, I believe, heard this lecture. So um, it's there for you if you need it. Um, vet forensics, this material is all going to be new to you. So, um, you know, make sure you watch this. Also, we want to remind you that you have that homework assignment that I'm going to um, put up on Talon today and um, don't have a due date for it yet. But basically, you can fill that out as um, you're listening to these lectures or going through the PowerPoints. Okay, life is good. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, <clears throat> so first of all, we've all heard the term blood spatter. Okay, that's correct. Um, that's more of a slang term. The correct term for this type of forensic discipline is blood stain pattern analysis. One thing that's not correct, or one, one term is blood splatter with an L. And unfortunately, um, you know, in the case study that we're going to watch, you'll hear detectives using that term. So um, technically it's not correct. It's blood spatter or blood stain pattern analysis. So first of all, um, let's do a basic definition. So the definition of blood spatter is right here. It is patterns made when blood strikes a surface. And of course that surface is anything. It's a wall, it's a ceiling, it's a couch, it's a person. Um, it can be anything. So, um, and the reason why this is a specific discipline um, is because, of course, as we know, blood is a liquid. So if blood was a solid, then the patterns made would fit into pattern evidence, which we've already talked about, you know, like um, shoe impressions and tire wear and tool marks and striations on a bullet, those types of things. But because it's a liquid, its patterns are going to be different. And not only is blood a liquid, but it is also what we call a viscous liquid. So I have a couple of examples here for you. So here we have just a cup of water and I'm gonna pour this into a bowl, okay? And as you know, I mean, water does not have a lot of viscosity, pours really quickly. So, you know, if we were to throw this against a wall, it's just gonna dry and evaporate, um, you know, really leave no trace. However, when we talk about a liquid that's viscous, like for example, this maple syrup, this, it just means that it's thicker. So viscosity means thickness. So let me pour this. And of course, I'm not gonna waste delicious maple syrup. I'm gonna pour it on this Eggo waffle, which I'm gonna eat later um, after I finish this lecture. So you can see how it's much thicker than water. That's what we mean by viscosity. And as you know from the previous lecture on blood identification, blood has a whole bunch of stuff in it, right? It's got red blood cells and white blood cells and platelets and you know everything but the kitchen sink in plasma. And thank God for us, when uh, blood is exposed to oxygen, it's going to start to clot. And if it didn't, we would all die from the tiniest little hangnail or paper cut. So. Blood is thicker than water is basically the bottom line. And because of that, it's going to make very characteristic patterns. Now, one of the patterns that's really important that you will see um, over and over again is this one right here, okay? So blood, that when you see it in a circular pattern like that, it tells you a couple of things. One, it's being dropped from basically directly above, which would be an angle of about 90 degrees. Also, because it's round, it is being dropped passively, which means that it's not being flung, you know, let's say from a knife that's moving at high speed. It's not being thrown off of, um, you know, a bullet that has just been fired from a gun. It's basically, if you think of, if you had a bloody nose and you just let it drip, um, so the only force acting on it is gravity. 
if you're dropping it from directly above, that's the pattern that you would see. Now, notice it's not completely round, okay? Even when something is dropped passively at a low speed, it's gonna kind of have this serrated, you know, saw blade appearance. You're gonna have these little guys out here, which are satellites. I'll define what those are. Um, but the overall pattern is going to be round. Okay, so this slide kind of illustrates that. So once again, when you see a blood stain that's circular, you do not have to calculate the angle because we know it's roughly 90 degrees. But when you start changing the angle, that's when you start seeing kind of a football or elliptical type of shape. So at 40 degrees, you'll notice it's a little more oval shaped. 30 degrees, it's a little more, um, you know, elliptical. When you get to 10 degrees, then it really starts to become um, very long. And so that simply tells you that the angle at which the blood is striking the surface is going, is becoming more extreme, basically. Okay. So where do we find blood spatter and, you know, blood pattern, blood stain pattern evidence? So basically, as we've learned, right, anything can be physical evidence. Hold on, I'm gonna get this set up right, I'm sorry. We know I'm a moron, we know that, we know I have no tech skills. Okay, so where can it be found? Well, we learned in physical evidence that, Lord knows, anything that exists could potentially be physical evidence. And the, the same, you know, and it's certainly not any different for blood spatter, but, if we look at the most common evidence types, blood spatter tends to be found most commonly on floors, walls, ceilings, and bedding. Ceilings especially, um, you see a specific type of spatter called cast off spatter, which we will get to in PowerPoint number two. Um, bedding, or like on a couch, it's really common simply because um, a lot of perpetrators, they don't want their victim to fight back. They, you know, want to attack them when they're there, they are at their most vulnerable. So, hey, you know, let's attack them while they're sleeping, um, you know, whether they tend to be sleeping. And so that's why we see it a lot in uh, or on bedding. So here's the thing that blood spatter is going to potentially do for an investigation. Now, some of you have probably watched the show Dexter, okay, which is a great show. I love it. I watched it too. But... Um, Dexter, and this is for the sake of TV, he can literally tell you every single movement of the victim, you know, which we tend to be, think of as the person who's bleeding. So Dexter at a crime scene will say, you know, oh, you know, she took a bite of her sandwich and then she looked to the right and then she walked two steps forward. So in reality, blood spatter is not going to give you a detailed play by play what it can do is approximately, okay, that's the keyword right there, tell a story as to potentially what happened, the order of events, um, you know, which blows came before others, potentially what, you know, broad category of weapon could have been used, but it's not going to give you a play-by-play -play like you see on TV. So, he, uh, these next two slides, I'm going to talk about what potentially can be learned from blood spatter. Now, realize, of course, you're not going to be able to check all of these boxes, but if you can learn a couple of the things, um, it's really helpful. And one of the things, and I've kind of tried to emphasize this, that forensic science is not just for the courtroom. So, Forensic scientists actually don't go to court very often. Um, you know, I worked thousands of comparisons and I think I went to court 35 times in the course of my career. So most of the time, forensic science is used during the investigation. And actually, if it helps a lot, then the you know police normally catch the perpetrator and they get a confession and then you never have to go to court. So Blood spatter especially can be really informative for detectives to, to know approximately what went on when they're going into, um, you know, interview or interrogate someone because it can tell them, mm, you know what, your, um, you know, your story really doesn't make sense. 
Okay, so it can tell us the direction potentially from which blood originated, the angle at which the blood droplet struck a surface, and that's the difference between the circle and the elliptical shape, um, the location and position of the victim at the time they were attacked. So were they laying down? Were they trying to run away? Were they in a kneeling position? Um, this one is actually very important. So blood spatter can tell you you know, approximately how many blows struck that victim. And that becomes really important when we're talking about premeditation, okay? So when I talked about, you know, charges of murder, you have first degree murder, second degree murder, you know, and then you go to lesser charges like manslaughter. So one of the elements for charging someone with premeditated murder or first degree murder is there has to be an element of premeditation, meaning that they thought about it and then they chose to go through with whatever act resulted in the death of that person. So, you know, if someone stabbed someone 34 times and that can be shown by the blood spatter, um, between each blow, they have a chance to stop and to not stab that person anymore. So the fact that there are 34 blows shows obvious premeditation. So premeditation does not have to mean, you know, the creepy guy that sits in his basement and plans a murder for, you know, years and months and however long. It can literally be a second. So a person deciding to, to stab a person again, that is premeditation. So that can be really, really important, knowing how many blows struck a victim. You can tell the approximate location of the, the perpetrator or the person who's uh, you know delivering the blows that produce that pattern. And it can tell you something about them. Were they right-handed, left-handed, how, you know, approximately how tall they were. Okay, these two kind of go together. So the type of injuries, now most of the time you're gonna have a body present, but let's say that the person was still alive and so EMS has removed that victim to get them to the hospital. Um, even when you look at the blood spatter, you can potentially tell what type of injuries would be present and what type of weapon was used. So blood spatter can show you the difference between a sharp force um, weapon, like you know, a knife, a screwdriver, or something like that, um, versus a blunt force weapon, like a baseball bat, you know, a chunk of firewood. So the pattern will show you the difference. The order in which the wounds were inflicted, you can potentially tell that because the blood patterns will be layered on top of each other. Um, this one, um, so when I worked cases with a lot of blood, um, I was doing it as a DNA person. And yeah, you can sample, you know, and try to figure out, you know, whose blood is whose. Um, when I look at bloody scenes, I'm looking for something that doesn't fit in. Um, first of all, I don't have the patience and the smarts to be a blood spatter expert because there's a lot of math and a lot of physics and you have to be uber patient. So as a DNA person, you know, I don't need to sample big pools of blood to show that the victim bled out because we probably already know that, especially if the body is at the scene. But I want to look for the offender and perhaps were they bleeding and so are there patterns that don't fit in. I'm going to show you um, a perfect example of that in a little bit from the O.J. Simpson case. So we can also tell um, you know, was the person laying in bed? Were they running? Um, whether the victim was moved after perhaps they were unconscious or deceased and also be able to calculate the distance that the blood drops fell before hitting any surfaces where they were found. So what are some variables to be considered when we're examining spatter patterns? Um, one of the biggest things is surface texture. So when you have blood that is landing on surfaces that have different texture, they're gonna have a different appearance. So when you have things that are non-porous, meaning that they're not absorbent, um, so you know a paper towel would be a very porous substance. Um, when you have something like a tile floor or a wall that you know doesn't have any texture to it, maybe glass that's smooth, um, also like you know this tabletop, 
which has no bumps on it, that would be considered. When you see that, you're actually gonna see less spatter. So if you drop a stain from directly above, that means it's gonna look you know, predominantly round. But if you would drop that blood from the same distance, onto a rough surface, like, you know, think of like a, a, a pile of firewood, um, carpeting, which has a bunch of texture, you know, thicker ply carpeting, popcorn ceilings, you know, any type of textured surface, then even if it's dropped passively from directly above, the shapes aren't gonna look round. They're gonna look different, um, very irregular. Um, the, it's gonna be more serrated. It's gonna have more satellite spatter. Um, so the key is, if you're working in law enforcement and you're trying to create blood spatter, then you have to use a similar um, type of texture or it's gonna be basically looking at you know apples and oranges. So let me show you a quick YouTube video that kind of explains this and I will upload um, this video as well. This is a great video too because it's really boring and it's good for putting you asleep or calming your nerves. So let me just show you a couple of these textures. Okay, and this blood is being dropped from the same height and from 90 degrees. And so when we see something like foam board, yeah, looks pretty round. You know, we do have some texture, some serration, some satellite spatter, typical copier paper, you know, looks kind of the same. Let me try to get it. Okay, so here, sandpaper, or no, I'm sorry, here, let me put it right here. Here's sandpaper. So still looks relatively round, um, but you know, obviously more serration. Here we have something really rough like plywood. So now that doesn't even look round, right? Oh, I'm sorry about this light in the background. Um, I'll change my position next time. I don't have any drapes on that um, curtain would shim. So it would be hard to look at that and say, you know, try to calculate the angle. Um, let me show you probably the most significant one. Here we have, I think this is concrete or no, asphalt. So yeah, I mean, can't even really see the original shape. Um, if we look at all of these surfaces, So they can look completely different, even though they're being dropped from the same angle and from the same height, okay? So surface texture um, is obviously a big deal. Okay, one last thing I wanna mention, and then I'll stop this video, because um, we're getting up to you know about the 20 minute mark, um, and I don't wanna overwhelm you, so I'm gonna divide this up into different um, you know chunks. So I, you've heard me mention the term satellite spatter. Satellite is whenever the drop hits, you're gonna have smaller droplets that come out um, according to you know blood hitting the, the majority of the volume in the middle, and then smaller droplets are going to come out to the side. Those are what we refer to as satellites, okay? So you have the main blood drop, and then when you see drops around the perimeter, those are what we refer to as satellites, and those are connected by thin little lines that we call spines. Okay, so this is where I'm gonna stop the video. Um, let's have one little, um, you know, nice moment. Um, have you ever wondered what it would be like to um, see a corgi eat part of a waffle? Well, you're about to find out. Hey, who wants a waffle? Come here. Come here, come here, come here, come here. Okay. What the heck is that? Pearl, yum. Boji, here you go, buddy. Come here, fingers. Sit like a gentleman or not. There you go. Okay, guys, I'll be back with the next video. Thanks.